I own an F-150 Lightning and I really like this truck, but there's trouble under the hood and Ford CEO Jim Farley knows these fails firsthand. You might be thinking, oh great, another boring range and charging complaint video. Actually, those don't even make the list. So get your popcorn, my favorite trucked up guys and gals, because the plot's about to thicken. We kick off number 10 with how this thing is put together. Unlike EV only companies like Tesla, Rivian, and BYD, Ford is nowhere near being vertically integrated. And CEO Jim Farley has said as much. Back in the 80s, the big push was towards outsourcing everything, sending a lot of production overseas to parts companies, which all came to a crashing halt and blew up in Ford's face when the global supply chain fell to pieces during COVID. But what's worse is that Lightning's many parts suppliers have little or nothing to do with one another. These systems often need a total workaround to be fully compatible, especially with electronic components. That means added complexity, weight, cost, and a higher risk of failure. In the Lightning, not everything is seamless or integrated both in in the software and hardware where pushing a square peg into a round hole is sometimes kind of obvious to the owner. More on that later. With the Lightning's weight ranging from 6,100 pounds to 6,900 pounds, this is no light duty truck. And because of that, number nine is all about inadequate factory tires for these things. Sure, we all know that EVs, if not driven conservatively, can go through tires pretty stinking fast, but these wear down much faster than expected. Few take into account the much higher cost of tire replacement over, let's say, an internal combustion F-150 that weighs well over 1,000 pounds less. Expect to pay almost 50% more. With Ford taking the cheapest rubber they could get, you, the consumer, get less performance, faster wear, and pay more later. Number eight, every EV truck maker is playing the off-road pitch. And yeah, the Lightning has some pretty nice creds. They got a rear locking differential, armor plating along the full underbody, robust rear control arms on a fully independent rear suspension, and oodles of torque and excellent low speed feedback in the off-road mode. In fact, I was kind of impressed by how they had configured this. But the clearance, the approach angle, and the departure angles make Jim Farley's claims little disingenuous. He knows it too. Why do you think Ford right now is working on the switch gear, an off-road beast based on the Lightning platform, but with double wishbone suspension, improved travel and armor protection, and most importantly, increased clearance? I'm calling on all the lift kit sponsors. I'm right over here. Over here. And for number seven, do you think that it's that difficult to throw, I don't know, a few more configurations of the Lightning out there, A eh, Ford? Jim, buddy, are you out there, man? Hey, chief, what do all my trucked up peeps have to say to Jim Farley on that one? Exactly. But Mr. Farley doesn't want to go all in on this truck. The increasing demand isn't growing as fast as he'd like. Jeez, I wonder why. Sure, most people will use these things as 1990s minivans. I get it. But really? Give us a freaking long box. Six foot, eight foot, I don't care. But every other truck by every other manufacturer on the frickin' planet offers a wide range of cabin and bed options. And the reason for that is, I don't know, that's what truck owners want for crying out loud? The more Ford treats this thing like something other than a regular truck, the more people will ignore it as a regular truck. <laughs> it's not rocket science, Jimmy, my boy. <laughs> Give us more options and you'll see a boost in demand. Wow, how did you figure that one out? Number six, cup holders. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But Ford had an opportunity here to go all out in the big interior with a clean slate. Instead, Ford took the almost spitting image of the F-150 internal combustion ice version because it's cheaper and easier and just added even cheaper plastic. Ah! You know this crap is gonna peel off, discolor, and, and it looks like poo in a few years. Then there's the tiny but stupid things, like the center console lid never staying up and smacking your funny bone every time you use it, to the cheap, crappy coin tray that slides back and forth every time you turn a corner. And then, of course, there's the lowest grade fabric on the XLT cloth seats that reminds you of what your old dog's pee pads look like after Fido went wee-wee. So thanks for the care in maintaining my truck's resale value for it. And here you are, already at the halfway point. 
Wow! And I'd love to have you along for a lot more trucked up stuff. So first, please like this video to keep YouTube happy and click the subscribe and bell notification icons because the more trucked up the community, the better. In fact, number five is also about loyalty and community and where I think Ford damaged that considerably. The price on this thing has gone up and down like a freaking yo-yo on Mount Everest, along with the trims Ford has restricted or reduced, leading to one of the biggest botches on getting a very popular EV truck into the hands of those who were demanding it when they originally ordered them. Instead, both Ford and the dealerships crank the prices on these things through the roof, going far beyond the original numbers Jim Farley offered everyone when the lightning rolled out. Worse, Ford stopped building lower trims, trying to force loyal Ford supporters into the highest priced ones. And dealers, <laughs> they saw an opportunity to make a crap pile more money by tacking on market adjustments. If you'd like to see what brand assassination looks like, well, here it is. Ford offered trims like the Pro and XLT and then allocated almost zero production for them. After scores of price increases and mistreatment of their loyal buyer base in a coerced Lariat Platinum push, reservation holders bailed, as did I for a while, and demand totally plummeted. Remember back at uh, number 10 at the beginning there when I first started blah, 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 when I mentioned more on outsourcing and vertical integration? Well, number four screams fail. And that's the almost worthless Ford Pass app. How this ever got approved is is beyond me. Let's say you just want to charge your truck to 60% at home just tomorrow morning. If you've already scheduled your charging times and amount, they're set for the week and weekends, but there is no option to just do this one time. You either have to go in and reset your whole schedule or just press charge to 100%, which is instant and you can't set a time on it. If you'd like to precondition your vehicle for the following morning, but at a different time than all of your other presets because you know, you're leaving later or you're leaving earlier. There's no button for just changing tomorrow. There's no, uh, nobody, they just. Not only is it bad, fails to load, crashes incessantly, takes forever to communicate with your truck, and for such a simple piece of software, manages to make everything difficult to find. The thing it is supposed to do can't be done in the truck or vice versa, or at least not easily. You either do it on the app or in the truck, but you can't, it's, and that leads into number three. The software is for the most part uh, bad. I, I love the layout and the idea of it all. In fact, it's really cool, but that doesn't wish it into actually working really well. In many cases, if you set something, it will unset it every time you get back in. For example, drive mode. I like sport mode. Ford doesn't like sport mode and wants me to be in normal mode. So it will ask, if you want to stay in sport mode every time you restart your truck, which of course I do, but it gives you only about, I don't know, a second to press a particular button before it vanishes and puts you back into normal. At least it's courtesy. It's like just before you drive into a pothole, the sign is located at the pothole. It's a little late and that's on a good day. When using Android Auto and you decide to listen to the radio, the lightning will arbitrarily go back and forth to Android Auto, Music, Spotify without warning and the radio, Android Auto, your phone ringing and the plethora of irritating pings and notifications will often uh, interact in a less than optimal manner and almost blow you out of the truck when the speakers let off a death yowl. Yeah, this is a thing. Systems often conflict with each other, whether it be the truck's Wi-Fi hotspot and your smartphone, or Ford's so-called navigation and Google Maps in Android Auto. There are also the sudden beeps, alarms, notifications, and so on that at first seem to happen for no good reason. I had owned a truck for like a month and a half already before I realized that the alarm that sounded like I might have driven over something living was notifying me that I was entering a school zone. As much as I love this truck, this is not Tesla software, let me tell you. And that brings me to number two, which I did a whole video episode on regarding Ford's insanely dangerous speed sign recognition system and adaptive cruise control. If you like playing pinball with your truck and the highway lines, adaptive cruise control 
is for you. If you'd like to be launched off an embankment or suddenly break on a major highway for what seems to be some kind of hallucination like a bad LSD trip being experienced by your vehicle, then speed sign recognition is your party toy. The only saving grace on both? You can turn them off. Well, charge me up and call me electrifying. You did it again. You're some kind of YouTube trucked up demigod. You're at number one. Ah, oh, the greatest disciples gather again. So, what did the weirdo come up with this time? That's what you're thinking. It's the one Jim Farley said he was so proud of, and what Ford had supposedly invested in heavily, and what Jim discovered the hard way as it sucked his CEO ego dry and called him dusty when he went on a road trip with a lightning, and that's the Blue Oval Charging Network. The first thing that comes to mind here is, uh, where, uh, is it? Not only does the truck itself not have a Blue Oval Network screen, nor your phone in trip planning, but supposedly there are like 800 gazillion billion of these charger systems littered across the Western Hemisphere, the Moon, and Universe. And it's as simple as locate, plug, and go. <sighs> yeah, no. Not at all. In reality, it's as easy to use and meaningful as folding your own eyelid over your head. In the US, it might be different, but in Canada, Ford's trip planner is so inaccurate that if you follow it, you'll likely end up stranded. Maybe I missed the two-week introductory course in how to find this crap in the menu, but I can't make any of it really work well. Neither can the vast majority of other Ford Lightning owners. There is no blue oval network in that Ford doesn't own any of these chargers. They just did what they do with the manufacturing process. They glued a whole whack of disparate suppliers and companies together together in a loose-knit association and stuck it on an app. Look, ignore all that. Download the charging company's own apps, I know, a lot of them, and use that instead. I have seven apps on my phone, two cards in my wallet, and a credit card on standby. It's a pain in the butt, but it never fails me. The same cannot be said for Ford's so-called network. If you'd like to learn more about some of the FUD surrounding EV trucks in the cold, or see my first-hand experience with Ford's on-again, off-again speed sign recognition system, please click the videos here. Thanks for watching.